Welcome, everyone. We might have a couple more people coming in, uh, but I think this is the majority of what, uh, what's going to be here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Matt Beck. I am a dietitian. Um, you might see RDN, other places. That stands for Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Um, I work in the Fixel Institute, of course. Um, I see mainly Parkinson's patients, uh, but I also see other um, uh, people with other conditions as well. But today I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about nutrition and how it relates to Parkinson's disease. We're going to talk about some of the symptoms and conditions related to it. And we're also going to talk about the diet that we recommend for Parkinson's disease based on the scientific literature we have today. So some of the things that I want you to leave today with is a little bit of understanding of the conditions related to Parkinson's disease and what that means for nutrition. What are the nutrition implications for those conditions? We're also going to talk a little bit, uh, like I said, about the diet and what the, the information out there now might be leading you to believe and what the scientific literature is actually pointing um, in uh, us, the direction that the literature is pointing us. Welcome. So getting ready for this talk, I just Googled nutrition and Parkinson's disease just to see what somebody newly diagnosed might search and might get uh, when you look it up on Google. Okay, so let's take a look here. Thankfully, the first items that come up are very good resources. So we have one here from the Parkinson's Foundation about diet and nutrition. We also have some information from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, another fantastic resource for you to use. We also have Stanford weighing in on some uh, nutrition information. Uh, of course, there is a good number of scientific articles as it relates to Parkinson's disease and nutrition. And then, of course, my friends at todaysdietitian.com also had something to say about it. All this to say, in about half a second, I got almost 16 million hits for just Parkinson's disease and nutrition. So there's a lot of information out there. Again, some of the information that comes up most prevalently is good information, but also there's some misinformation out there as well. So we want to be able to differentiate the good versus the bad. And hopefully today with my talk, you'll be able to do that when you leave. So we'll start off talking about some of the conditions, the symptoms, and the side effects of Parkinson's disease and the nutrition implications for them. So again, this is going to be focused in on nutrition. Obviously, you're going to work with your physician. You're going to work with your speech language pathologist. You're going to work with your rehab people to get the adequate treatment for you overall. We're an interdisciplinary team. We're all going to be doing different things. So just because I don't mention something doesn't mean we're not going to do it. We're only talking about nutrition here today. So as it relates to nutrition, Parkinson's disease can have a number of relevant side effects and conditions that you might be dealing with or your family members might be dealing with. Some of them are listed up here. So we have hypotension, so low blood pressure, altered taste and smell, um, swallowing difficulties, also called dysphagia, constipation, very prevalent, um, also some food medication interactions, and I see a lot of patients with weight loss and anorexia problems. Anorexia, in this sense, I don't want you to think anorexia nervosa, the eating disorder. We're just talking about general loss of appetite. That's kind of what anorexia means here. So we'll start off talking about some of the ones where we have pretty simple, pretty straightforward nutrition interventions, and then we'll kind of get into the, the more deep or more involved conditions that we kind of need to uh, have a little bit more close interaction and intimate real uh, interaction to kind of treat. So first one, low blood pressure. This one's pretty simple. And again, this can be treated with drugs. This can be treated with other things. But nutritionally, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the patient is well hydrated. This will kind of allow the blood volume to be increased and kind of raise that blood pressure. We also, in this situation, are kind of allowed to take liberties with salt intake. A lot of people kind of shy away from salt because they've heard everything about it as far as hypertension. But when it comes to hypotension, we really want to kind of bump that salt up, uh, intake up if uh, indicated by the other disciplines, by your physician and everybody else. Um, sometimes, based on medication or the disease progression, you might have an altered taste or smell. And so nutritionally, obviously, the first thing you want to do is just avoid those foods that kind of take your appetite away or cause you to become nauseated. You know, pretty simple. After that, for instance, if you have a lack of taste, um, you might want to spice up the food. You might want to add salt to food. So I am not a super taster, but my partner, her name is Adrian. Uh, she is a super taster. We cook at home all the time. 
Um, she can add no salt to food, and she's like, this is delicious, this is fantastic. And I'm sitting there with just a goop of texture in my mouth, wondering what it tastes like. So I have to add salt to food. So again, if indicated and if necessary, uh, we can add the salt to food. We also want to add some spice to food. We want to make sure that we're adding a, a variety of vibrant, beautiful, distinct spices to the food so that it actually has good flavor and kind of drives us to want to eat more of it. Especially, um, uh, not really concerning, but the spices that we really want to emphasize with Parkinson's is uh, turmeric, cinnamon, and rosemary. Again, those nice, vibrant, beautiful spices that we can add to food pretty easily. So preliminary data suggests that those antioxidant effects might have something to do or might have an effect on Parkinson's disease. It's still being elaborated on, but right now the, the literature does indicate that you might want to add those. But it's not something to where you really want to get too deep in the nitty gritty of how much and how often. It's just you want to cook with a variety of spices every day. Don't worry about how much. Just make it, make it tasty. So, sorry, somebody have a question? Um, not specifically, not that I've read. So especially if you have gastroesophageal reflux disease or heartburn, you want to stay away from peppermint. That kind of lowers um, the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter and it allows food to come back up. So peppermint specifically, you kind of want to stay away from if you do have uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Um, as far as ginger goes, that can calm the stomach. So if you are nauseated a lot, you can do ginger to kind of calm that. But as far as it relates specifically to Parkinson's disease, not so much. Um, one of the more common um, conditions related to Parkinson's disease is swallowing difficulty or dysphagia, as we like to call it. So this one, you'll work very closely with your speech language pathologist um, to identify the foods and texture that are most appropriate and safe for you to eat. So what we might recommend after a swallow eval is chopping, mincing, or blending foods based on how severe the swallowing difficulty is. So we also might want to lubricate foods um, with sauces, oils, condiments, dressings, so that they kind of go down a little easier. If somebody is experiencing swallow difficulties, they might also be experiencing weight loss. And so again, you also might want to add these toppings, these extra things to the food to increase calories so that you can get more in, more bang for your bite, as we like to call it, more calories for each bite that you take. Of course, if we have severe swallowing difficulty, we do want to uh, avoid foods that are dry, crunchy, and sticky. Um, I'm thinking of peanut butter, almond butter, some other nuts like that that you might not want to do. And then, of course, if we have to, we can even thicken liquids. There's some products on the market that you can add to even water or coffee. That kind of thickens it up and makes it a little easier to swallow if we have a little bit of lack of strength with swallowing. But again, this one is where the dietitian, the patient, and the speech language pathologist work very closely to identify what texture of food we need to do. So constipation is one of the most prevalent conditions that I see in my patients. Uh, sometimes it is experienced chronically decades before even a Parkinson's diagnosis. So adequate hydration is important, but what the literature suggests is hydration is actually not as important as one might think. Um, you absolutely want to be hydrated. Uh, you know, eight cups a day is a great rule of thumb. Um, better is if you look at your urine. You kind of want clear or just pale yellow urine. If it's highly concentrated, that's a dead giveaway that you've either taken a multivitamin supplement uh, very recently or you're not adequately uh, hydrated with fluid. More importantly, we really want to impress the importance of dietary fiber. The number one medical nutrition therapy and really the only therapy for constipation is increased dietary fiber. So we want to increase both insoluble and soluble fiber. So I'll talk a little bit about these briefly. Insoluble fiber is kind of what we get from those dark green leafy veggies. It doesn't really change when it comes in contact with water. You can kind of think of a celery stick. You plunge that in a glass of water, it's not really gonna swell up very much. It's kind of, you know, at a balance. It's not gonna change very much in water. Alternatively, you throw a scoop of oatmeal into water, that's gonna kind of puff up and expand. That's soluble fiber. So we really want a mix of both, but especially soluble fiber 
to kind of get into the bowels and enhance um, those bowel movements. What happens in neurological diseases is there's kind of a miscommunication between the gut and the brain. And what we want to do is we want to really stretch the bowels after we eat, and we do that with, with fiber. And so once those bowels get stretched, there's stretch receptors in the intestines, and they're like, hey, there's food in here. The brain says, okay, yeah, there's food in there. Let's start peristalsis. So peristalsis is that musculature, that movement that pushes food along the gastrointestinal tract. So that's the point of fiber. We really want to increase that. Where do we get fiber, of course? I've already mentioned veggies, um, fruits, whole grains and cereals, and especially pulses. Anybody have a guess what a pulse is or anybody know what a pulse is? No? It's actually a term more used overseas than in America, and I'm not really sure why, but pulses are the seeds of legumes. So that's going to be your uh, beans, dried peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Some of my favorite foods, very high quality protein, very high in fiber, and great sources of energy. Sure, so that's going to be uh, beans, dried peas, lentils, and chickpeas. That's a great question. So I've seen patients who have very little dietary fiber or they get very little dietary fiber day to day. Um, and in general, we want 25 to 35 or so, depending on if it's a male or female, grams of fiber a day. But I have people who are eating 40, 45 grams of fiber a day. In those situations, you still might need to bump it up. I mean, that's, that's more than the recommended amount, but you can't get enough dietary fiber. You might start to get gastrointestinal symptoms at some point, especially if you eat too much dietary fiber too fast, like you go from a low, di uh, low fiber diet to a high fiber diet. But it's something that we can kind of ramp up until we see mitigation of those symptoms. And something that I do want to mention about constipation, it's not just infrequent bowel movements. It's also bowel movements where you have to strain or they feel incomplete or unsatisfying. So you could have a bowel movement every day, but if you're straining every day, you can still kind of quantify that as constipation. Okay. What happens if a person has like gives back to the diseases? And do you propose that instead of having like three meals a day, having more frequent? Absolutely. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit in a moment, but there's um, very personal changes we can make to the diet. Um, so if somebody is having very slow transit through the bowels, we still want to actually increase dietary fiber. But this is also where we might want to enlist the help of prokinetic drugs. So there are drugs that kind of can help move things move the gastrointestinal tract a little faster if there's very, very slow movement. So there's a couple different ways we can attack it. So that's, that's something we can work on personally. Yes, ma'am. The, the beans. Mm -hmm. Do you suggest the dried beans and then bringing them, you know, to uh, edible form? Yes, or of course. Beans? I'm both, actually. Okay. Yeah, you can buy the dried beans in bags. Those are usually more economical, um, but you can buy them out of the can, too. Perfectly so can fine. Is fine. Canned is perfectly fine. Absolutely. So when you said the dried peas, I thought you said it was mm -hmm. Oh, no, dried peas as well. So, again, you would bring those yeah. to edible uh, consistency oh, okay. and then and do it. Yeah. Yeah, you can buy them dry. Absolutely. Most people buy them either frozen or fresh, but yes, you can buy them dry. So it really depends on which bean or product we're talking about or cooked or uncooked. But I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a couple of slides. And so <coughs> when I talk about that, I'll address that question. It really does not. No, all beans are good. Um, you know, you could do red beans. Um, garbanzo beans, green beans less so much. Those are more a starchy vegetable. Um, we really want, kind of want those nice big beans, kind of when you think about kidney beans, black beans, things Lima like that. Beans. Lima beans are, yeah, they're up there too, absolutely. Uh, Mung beans, uh, absolutely. Sorry, what was that, what was the question? Metamucil. Metamucil. So, Metamucil, again, is a tool that we can definitely utilize. Um, Metamucil, Benafiber, Miralax are all products that your physician will probably talk to you about. My, again, dietitians are always food first. I'm not going to say, oh, you're constipated, let's take some Miralax. I'm going to try to figure out the nutrition that we can get you on so that we don't have to do Miralax. A lot of times, if somebody's been on Miralax for a long period of time, they become dependent 
on it for a bowel movement. Same thing with like Senna products, the herbal products that kind of induce a bowel movement. So I don't like seeing a lot of those types of products, especially Miralax, the laxative effects. Um, Benefiber and things like that, the, the fiber supplements, those are fine, <laughs> especially if we're finding hard to include beans and fruits and veggies in the diet because maybe we are ha experiencing early satiety, so you're getting full too fast or something like that. So those are tool in our toolbox, but we're going to attack it with nutrition first if we can. So I'm sure that some of you at least have done a little bit of reading on potential food medication interactions. And if you can kind of guess from my picture there, most people with Parkinson's disease think about or are concerned with the protein carbidopa levodopa interaction. So my first uh, interaction with Dr. Oaken, this is actually something we talked about. And so I mentioned to him, hey, Dr. Oaken, what do you think about this you know, protein carbidopa levodopa interaction? What do you think about that? And I was surprised to hear him talk about how it actually is a significant problem much less of the time than you would typically think. So at first he said, you know, about one in 10 patients actually have this serious protein, cinnamon, ritari, carbidopa, levodopa interaction. And I was like, man, that's, that's not very much, one in 10. Um, but once I started seeing patients and hearing their stories, that's absolutely true. It is a very small subset of the population that actually has to be concerned with this protein, carbidopa, levodopa interaction. So most of the time what you can do is you can take the drug exactly as your pharmacist will tell you, 30 minutes before a meal or two hours after a meal. You want to increase the efficacy by taking it on an empty stomach, even if you're somebody who doesn't experience the significant interaction between those two. If you do have an interaction between those two, you will know. You will, it will be as if you got no effect from the drug, even if you took it 30 minutes beforehand. If you take it too close, it's as if you took nothing. So what do we do in those situations? So if somebody is uh, taking the drug uh, every five to six hours, as we, we typically begin the dosing at, four to six hours, then it's pretty easy to kind of squeak your meals in in between the dosage of the meal time. Once the disease progresses, we might need to start taking the drug more often, every three hours and even two hours in some unfortunate situations. Then you can imagine you're butting up meals right up against dosing times. And so in those situations, if it's, um, if it's a serious issue, we'll just have to make sure that we're really regimented in our timing um, as it relates to meals and medication dosing. But if we can't do that, if it's too hard, basically what we might have to do is what we call backload protein. So what that means is basically you have very little protein in the first part of the day, and you save it all for the latter half of the day. So once two, three o'clock rolls around, again, depending on bedtime and you know, your personal life and your personal schedule, you save a lot of that protein for later. So you might have a, a little supper time snack that's high in protein, um, and then a good dinner with a nice quality source, high quality source of protein, and then maybe an after dinner snack of a little bit of protein as well. So we're getting adequate protein in the diet. Those times of day, we usually don't need as refined and precise motor symptoms. So you might become more dyskinetic at those times, but that's really the sacrifice and compromise that we need to make to make sure that we're getting the adequate nutrition in. So diverticulitis um, really occurs, or uh, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, the inflammatory condition of diverticulosis, really comes about when somebody shifts from a low fiber diet to a high fiber diet too quickly. Once you're on a high fiber diet, you really don't need to be too concerned with seeds or berries at that point. It's definitely when you have diverticulitis, the actual inflammatory condition you'd be currently experiencing, that's when we kind of need to make some nutritional changes, maybe avoid certain things at those times. But nuts and berries and seeds and things like that don't necessarily need to be avoided depending on where the condition is at. So we can definitely talk about that on a more personal basis during counseling if, if you're experiencing that. Yes, ma'am. Brand new to us, and I'm not even sure if it's part of, is the diagnosis, but what is the thing about the protein that I'm, I'm not... Sure. So where this kind of comes from is, is the dietary protein competes with the drug to get into the body and into the brain. 
And so we don't know why these one in 10 people have this interaction. It could be a different number of transporters. We, we really are not sure why, um, but it's just something that we have to take in consider. And, and hopefully, uh, or thankfully rather, it's not too many people. But if it is, if you are somebody who does have the significant interaction, there are ways to mitigate it as we just talked about. Yes, ma'am. So, like, if my husband takes his pills and then he eats something like that protein, mm -hmm. because his worst time is in the morning, um, he can't keep his eyes open, he gets sleepier, that's cause of the medicine's not working because of the protein that he might have ate? Uh, potentially, potentially, but... Because the other time, then I would probably say that it's probably I not the protein. Issue. It's probably not the protein. If, if you take it at lunchtime, uh, if you take your carbidopa levodopa drug at lunchtime, and then 30 minutes later you have a meal that has protein in it, and it, it works fine, it's probably not the protein. Well, he takes it, doesn't take it with his meals. Okay, so yeah, that's... Um, stuff. It takes like two hours. Gotcha. And it's, it's saturating slower then. It might be uh, a dosing timing, but I'd love to talk with you more about that maybe afterwards. Uh, we can definitely kind of refine that out, make sure that we're, we're on the best schedule. We'll work with a physician as well. Right. Absolutely. So one of the more common conditions, just like uh, swallowing difficulties and constipation, is weight loss. So with preliminary data, we're now seeing that weight loss might even occur before Parkinson's diagnosis. And so it's something that we want to be at least peripherally aware of. I'm not saying that we have to weigh ourselves every day. I actually don't recommend that. Um, but uh, it's something if you want to be aware of where you're at as far as weight goes. So once a week is good, um, you know, just to kind of be aware of where you're at and if your weight is changing significantly. If you weigh it weight, uh, day to day, there's changes in fluid status and you know, other things that will differ uh, day to day, so we're not really concerned about that. Weekly weigh-ins are, are a better idea than daily. So as the disease might progress, ye, the patient might experience uh, this weight loss for a number of reasons. One being you might, be, you might have lost your appetite, you know, whether it's from the medications you're on or just disease progression, loss of appetite. Also might be early satiety. You know, you might be getting full faster for whatever reason, and, you know, a typical meal, you're, you're kind of full quarter of the way through it. So there's a different number of reasons. There also might be an underlying increase of energy expenditure, uh, expenditure from different organ systems. So sometimes the muscular system will start eating up more energy as the disease progresses. Sometimes the brain will start eating up more energy. And so you feel the same, but your weight's dropping, and we're not sure why. So it could just be this increased metabolic activity. Uh, from the disease. So how do we combat this? So we have to make a plan. You have to work with your dietitian and your physician to kind of make a plan because a lot of times I'll see somebody after a year or two years of just this slow chronic weight loss and I would have loved to intervene well before that. You know, eat, you know, when you just start noticing a couple pounds and you haven't changed anything, that's when we should probably start getting in front of it because when it goes on for months and years, we, we're getting close to that point where it's very hard to come back from that. So what can we do? So obviously we we'll want to increase intake. A lot of the patients that I talk to, they're like, oh, well, I don't, usually don't have a breakfast or I have a light lunch and then I have a big dinner. Well, right there, that's an easy place to sneak in some extra calories. If you say, oh man, I'm not really hungry at breakfast time or I'm not really hungry around lunchtime. What we kind of have to do at that point is train the body to expect food. A lot of times, if you just uh, chronically skip meals, you won't be hungry at that time. But once we start adding that meal back in, even if you're not hungry, and I'm not suggesting that you eat until you're uncomfortable, but just eating something at noon if you usually skip lunch. After a couple of weeks, noon will roll around, you'll be like, man, I'm kind of hungry. You know? So it's retraining the body to kind of expect food at certain meal times. And again, this kind of goes back to more meals throughout the day, especially if somebody is experiencing early satiety. If they are eating quarter or half si portion sizes and getting full, that's when we're gonna increase the number of meals and snacks to six, seven, or eight, or more even, um, so that we're getting adequate amount of caloric intake over the entire day. It might be smaller um, per meal time, but overall, we're increasing the caloric intake. We also wanna emphasize those high calorie protein, high calorie snacks, 
um, different foods that can kind of increase or maintain lean body mass. We really don't want to lose that muscle tissue because that's where a lot of our immune system is and where we, uh, obviously, we use our musculature to do a lot of different things. And so we really want to go in on the high calorie stuff like the hummus, the tahini, the avocado, the oils, again, the dressings, different ways to increase calories, lots of great sources of protein that I'll talk about in a minute. Again, we kind of already talked about a schedule. Again, if you're not used to eating at one time or you usually don't have a snack at a certain time, add that snack in. You'll come to expect it and you'll get used to eating more. And again, we want to utilize the tools that we have available to us. So again, dietitians are food first, but there's a lot of great companies out there that make great nutrition supplements. So I'm sure you've seen them, Ensure, Boost, I'm sure there's a lot of other ones, but those are high quality nutrition supplements that we can use that are high protein, lots of vitamins and minerals that we can kind of add to the day, especially if you really don't want to prepare a meal or eat a snack at that time, we can just down a quick little Ensure and you're getting an extra 350 calories from that high quality protein. So we've talked a lot about the conditions and the symptoms as it relates to Parkinson's. Let's talk about the diet, okay? This is where a lot of people ask me, well, what do I eat? So and I'm happy to talk about this. So if you do another Google search, you'll see a lot. You'll see the MIND diet. You'll see the ketogenic diet. This one's huge right now. I see a lot of people coming in talking about it. Gluten-free diet even. I didn't know that was a thing for Parkinson's disease until somebody was talking to me about it. But what does the scientific literature indicate? What is best for kind of uh, maintaining good motor function and best for overall health? What's cardioprotective? What's good for the mind? Well, if you've been paying attention to the pictures that I've had on screen, you probably have a very good idea of what I'm about to say. If you've heard me talk before, you know what I'm about to say. And if you thought the mind diet was what I was going to say, you were really close. The Mediterranean diet is what I always recommend to my patients. This is a diet that is colorful, beautiful, delicious in every sense of the word. Um, you can have a lot of fun with this diet. It is not a low fat diet as some people typically kind of market at. It is an adequate protein, adequate fat diet that we really want to lean into. And so all of these foods that you see on the screen here are things that we want to get in every day. But let's talk about specifics. So firstly, we'll talk about what we really want to emphasize in the diet the most. These are the things that we kind of want to be doing almost every day if we can. So fruit, especially deep reds, deep blues, the blueberries, the raspberries, the blackberries, the strawberries. These are especially good for Parkinson's disease with the preliminary, uh, preliminary data that we've uh, seen. Uh, we also want to do a lot of veggies, lots and lots of veggies, and not just the starchy ones, not just the corn, the potatoes, the green beans, things like that. We really want a wide array of variety, lots of colors, lots of variety in there. Um, we also want to do whole grains, so quinoa, your uh, whole, uh, you know, like whole grain pasta, things like that. You don't have to shy away from those. You can really lean into those as well. Pulses again, those beans, those lentils, we really want to do those. Those are some of my favorite foods. Nuts are high quality protein, lots of great fats in there. And then also very liberal use of culinary olive oil. You can almost drink it out of the bottle before I'll tell you to back off. That's how much olive oil you can kind of go in on. Um, just extra virgin olive oil. So the it's not really a big deal, but Trader Joe's, uh, I'm not sponsored by them in any way, of course. Uh, Trader Joe's has a very delicious olive oil, um, and I know that they actually source theirs out of the Mediterranean, out of Italy, I believe. With the other ones, you just want to make sure that it's a good source. Really, just you want to make sure it's quality olive oil. Word organic, here in there? Um, not necessarily. Um, again, if it's coming from a, a place where you can track it and it's not a weird blend of different oils, it's actually real extra virgin olive oil. That's really what we're going for. You absolutely can. So you can cook with it. Um, you can really do almost anything with it. Now, I'm not saying that you want to bake a cake with olive oil. That's kind of gross. Uh, no, I know you can. Um, well, I'll have to get it from you then because uh, I'm a little suspect of that. But. Um, yeah, so you really you can cook with it in any way you can. Um, the only thing I would recommend is just keep in mind it has a uh, tiny bit lower smoke point than other, uh, other oils. So you can't, you can't just rip it up 
all the way to, to high on the stovetop, you might end up smoking and burning the oil. So what do we want kind of the middle ground on? What, what do we kind of want to emphasize, but not as much as the other things that I just talked about? So we really want to go in on the fatty fish at least once a week, uh, up to three or four times a week. Even if you don't like it, there's lots of ways we can prepare it that you might enjoy it. So we really want to emphasize the tuna, the mackerel, the salmon, the herring, and sardines. Um, if you just like salmon, just go in on salmon. You know, you don't have to do a variety of this, but we do want to get it in at least once a week. Very good for the, uh, very cardio protective, very good for the mind. We also can do a little bit of dairy, a little bit of cheese. Now, a lot of people that I see out in the restaurants, they're not having salad with a little cheese on top. They're having a cheese salad, okay? So that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking a little bit of feta on top, you know. Don't go to Olive Garden and, you know, let them grind the Parmesan on it for six minutes and then tell them to stop, okay? A little bit of, a little bit of cheese. Yogurts are great, especially if you're adding fruit, adding nuts to it. Great snack, great breakfast, fantastic thing to add in the diet. Eggs are fine. We just don't want to do it excess and don't fry them, you know, don't fry them every day. Um, poultry, uh, white meats, those are fine as well. Again, really more emphasis on the fatty fish than the white meats. What we really want to stay away from and really only do occasionally is refined sugar products and red meat. The scientific literature is pretty clear that high consumption of these foods over time are very bad for health uh, in humans. Um, so we really want to limit those as much as we can. Not saying that we can't do those, but we need to make it a treat. This is not an every night thing. This can be a once a week, once every other week thing. Something to look forward to. So let's talk about mastering this Mediterranean diet. I'll talk a little bit more about the amounts that we want to do. So I will make sure here. So I've got about six minutes, I believe. Um, so almost done here. So only use olive oil if you can, okay? If you talk to Dr. Mariganori, another physician in our office, uh, he'll say throw out your butter, throw out your lard, throw out your Crisco. If you want to massage your partner with it, you can do that, but just don't <laughs> cook with it, okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, yep, throw out butter, throw out the butter. Oh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of butter stuff. There are, there are things we can substitute, so we can talk about that too. Um, so we want to do at least two, two servings of vegetables a day. Um, one second, I'll, I'll get you in one second here. So uh, two servings of vegetables a day. You probably think a serving is, uh, a vegetable is a little larger than what it actually is, so you really probably want to bump up your vegetable intake. Um, and we can talk about that specifically later as well. So at least three servings of fruit a day. We also want to enjoy wine with dinner, especially red wine, if we drink and if indicated by your physician that you can do so. Um, obviously, if you know, you're on a medication that doesn't allow you to do that, unfortunately, we can't do that. But uh, moderate red wine consumption is completely fine. Uh, don't forget to add the beans again. I love the pulses. I love the lentils. I love the chickpeas. Add those at least three times a week. There's a half cup a day habit or the half cup habit that the pulse industry kind of talks about. If you want to do half cup a day, fantastic. Again, high quality protein, great amount of fiber. Also, again, fatty fish three or more times a week. Uh, nuts, especially walnuts, hazelnuts, almonds, and peanuts three times a week. Um, also choose white meat over red, as we were talking about. And then if you've ever heard of something called sofrito, we definitely want to start a lot of meals with that. So sofrito is kind of this, this base of a lot of Mediterranean dishes that is olive oil, garlic, leeks or onion, and tomatoes. So if you don't know what to cook, just throw these into a pan and see what you got. You know, can you make a really great meal just with this base? So we want to use that base of sofrito at least three times a week. And then again, Save that red meat, save the soda pop, save the candy, save the crackers, save the, well, not necessarily crackers, but the pastries, the cakes, save those for special occasions. You know, once a month, a couple of times a month, make it a special occasion. Go out with your partner or your family and enjoy yourself when you're out, but just don't do it every night. A couple of times a week at the most. You had a question, ma'am? That is, it depends on what we're talking about. So if you have an idea, so for instance, cruciferous vegetables, um, the leafy veggies, you know, you're probably going to want to do about two or three cups as one serving. So it, it's a lot depending on what we're talking about. So if you need specifics, I can send you a document. I'm going to give you all my contact information when we're done here. And I can, you know, a quick Google search will also tell you specifically, I'm cooking this, what's one serving cooked? So we can do that too. So right now, I'd kind of like to ask for your all's help. So again, I just started in the Fixel Institute last year. 
While there is some great scientific literature out there as it relates to Parkinson's disease and nutrition, there's still a lot of work to be done. It's kind of in its infancy stage. And so what I'd ask you all to do is if you're interested in participating in nutrition studies as it relates to Parkinson's disease, please contact us. If we can, we're going to be doing a lot of studies over these next couple years with the nutrition in mind, and we need your help and your data to kind of get towards new therapies, um, the etiology of Parkinson's disease as it relates to the gut, and maybe even a cure. So we really need to understand and get that data. So if you're interested, please reach out to me. I'm going to give you my phone number. I'm going to give you my email address. Feel free to contact me for anything, whether it is recipes, nutrition questions, or if you're interested in research. Splenda. Um, Let's talk how bad it is for you. Well, you know, there's a, it? Yeah, there's a lot of information out there um, as it relates to artificial sweeteners. I tend to kind of shy away from it because the, the data doesn't, it's unclear. Um, it's not likely to be cancerous as you sometimes read, um, but Splenda should not be something that you are really going in hard on in your diet anyway. You know, if you want some, some sweetness, have some sugar, you know, but again, shouldn't be every day. You know, there's, there's different things that uh, occur when you add artificial sweeteners to the diet. You might have less uh, sweeteners like in beverages, but you might overeat other times. And so there's a very complex balance between artificial sweeteners and the diet, and we're not real sure about which way it's gonna go, but more research will help. Uh, stevia is kind of in the same boat. Um, again, it's something that you can utilize. It's most likely not harmful, but um, there are other things that we prefer you to eat rather than adding a, uh, stevia to certain things. But if you put it in your tea here and there, that's completely fine. So this is my great friend and uh, amazing dietitian, Carly Rush. If I am not at the clinic, she is. So we have full-time coverage uh, with dietitians in the Fixel Institute. So if I'm not there, she'll be more than happy. She is more than capable of answering any and all questions that you might have as it relates to Parkinson's disease and nutrition. So I'm going to leave her uh, information up there just for one second. That's our uh, uh, shared number, uh, but that's her email that you can contact yeah, her at. We can, uh, will you put that back up later so we can either take a picture sure. of it or? Sure, absolutely. Um, and then my uh, contact information is here. My name is just Beck Matthew at UFL, or my uh, email is beckmatthew at ufl.edu. I'd like to thank you all for your participation and attention today. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them now before the next session starts.